Genau. Ja, ja. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Mein Name ist Dominik Winkelde und ich äh, begrüße Sie heute Abend eben zum, äh, zur fünften Lagebesprechung. Die vierte kommt noch. Äh, wir haben die fünfte vorgezogen. Und ich freue mich besonders, Ihnen heute Abend äh, John Searle vorstellen zu dürfen, der sich ganz spontan bereit erklärt hat, hier heute Abend äh, seine Philosophie zu präsentieren oder einige philosophische Themen. Ich mache diese Veranstaltung zusammen mit Clemens Braunschlegel von der LMU, ich selber lehre an der Hochschule für Philosophie äh, und äh, der Leiter dieses äh, Lost Weekends studiert bei uns und deswegen hat er uns oder mir die Möglichkeit gegeben, diese Veranstaltung hier zu, hier zu machen. Der Abend sieht so aus, dass wir ungefähr eine Dreiviertelstunde äh, John Searle zuhören und dann würde ich sagen, gibt es gleich eine offene Diskussion äh, mit Ihnen und die ganze Veranstaltung wird ungefähr nach anderthalb Stunden zu Ende sein, also das ist so äh, eben Mein Kollege ist, äh, ist verhindert und ich bin leider auch etwas angeschlagen, also sollte ich wie umkippen, dann äh, habe ich halt schmal rausgebeten, äh, meine, meine Führung zu übernehmen. Äh, einige Worte zu John Searle, ich glaube, die meisten, den meisten muss ich Ihnen gar nicht vorstellen. Äh, 1939 geboren und er lehrte und prägte besonders das Philosophie-Department an der University of California at Berkeley mit seinen Kollegen, auch alle sehr, sehr prominent. Und das Beeindruckende seines Werkes, ich glaube, dass wir die meisten auch wissen, ist, dass er berühmt geworden ist durch seine Sprechtheorie, auch durch sein politisches Engagement in der Studentenbewegung, aber dann fast auf allen möglichen klassischen Feldern der amerikanischen und der Gegenwartsphilosophie publiziert hat, im Bereich der Philosophie des Geistes, in einer teilweise scharfen Auseinandersetzung mit reduktionistischen, eliminativen Reduktionisten, in der, natürlich in der Linguistik, in der, Sp in der Sprechaktheor Sprechaktheorie, der Sprachphilosophie und dann äh, in der Sozialphilosophie unter dem Kontext oder unter dem Titel von Social Ontology. Und sein letztes Buch ist äh, besonders nochmal der Erkenntnistheorie, gewidmet äh, Seeing Things as They Are. Und all seine Werke, kommt teilweise immer wieder zurück auf seine frühen Arbeiten, wo insofern er sowohl eben Social Ontology wie auch Philosophie des Geistes immer auch wieder mit seiner Sprechaktheorie verbindet. Und heute Abend ist die Idee, dass Herr Searle über einige fundamentale Probleme der Philosophie spricht. Er sprach von, von zehn, jetzt hat er erstmal nur sieben gefunden, aber das mag ja auch schon reichen. Und, We are very glad that you are here. Thanks for, for being with us. And we would like to hear what, what do you perceive as the seven most important or ten most important problems in philosophy. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, these are not the seven most important problems. They're the seven most outrageous mistakes, the most idiotic mistakes that I was brought up on and that uh, my students are brought up on. I try to cure them. But finally it's occurred to me, I ought to make a list of all these hideous mistakes and maybe even publish a list, who knows. Okay, now I'm going to start with a mistake that's not really philosophy proper, but more likely political theory. But it's very relevant to the present time, uh, what with these elections going on in the United States. Here's the assumption that people make. In a democratic society, the really important decisions have to be made by the electorate in a free vote. They must be decided by majority opinion. Uh, that is such a stupid mistake uh, that uh, I can't imagine anybody believes it, but a lot of people pretend to believe it. Uh, the United States was lucky in that the people who founded the country, the founding uh, fathers, as we used to call them, but that was politically incorrect. Uh, the Founding Fathers were deeply suspicious of governmental power. So if uh, President Trump ever becomes president, he's going to find he has very little power. Uh, what I have discovered in my lifetime is though we have these passionate elections and it's made us feel like uh, the end of civilization if our guy doesn't win and the, and, um, the beginning of a new civilization if our guy does win. In fact, it doesn't make much difference to my life which party is in power. The tax rates are a little bit different and there's more money or less money for public service. Uh, but in any case, uh, the secret of successful democracy is that the important decisions must not be decided by elections. Why not? 
the elections are too unpredictable. They're too, as we're finding out right now. All of the experts predicted Trump would long since have fallen by the wayside long before this, and now it turns out he might become president. But I guarantee you, it will make very little difference to my daily life if he's president because he will be hemmed in. He says he's going to build a wall uh, between the United States and Mexico. Where in the Constitution does it empower him to do that? It's a very restrictive document. And so on. He's going to, abide, he's going to prevent Muslims from coming into the country. He would never get away with that. The courts wouldn't let him. Uh, so there have been times when the uh, election made a life and death difference. Uh, the last time was 1860 when Lincoln was elected and, and the effect uh, was quite dramatic. It had to come eventually, but it produced a civil war, a colossal war. Another time was 1932 when Roosevelt was elected and Roosevelt, though nobody knew it at the time, saved capitalism uh, from its own idiocy because that was 25% unemployment, and he did something about it. But for the most part, it doesn't make a great deal of difference uh, to the lives of ordinary people who is elected. Who makes the life and death decisions? Well, uh, often nobody does. They just kind of float along. But when they have to be made, we let the Supreme Court do it. Uh, they're unelected, they're not responsible to anybody, and nobody has any a reason why they make the decisions they do. They're often idiotic, but we put up with them. Now we put up with them because, well, that's the way it evolved. It's not in the Constitution. It doesn't give the, uh, the Supreme Court the right to decide such issues as racial equality uh, or abortion rights or even to rule laws unconstitutional. Uh, but that's how it's turned out, and it works pretty well. So if you're losing sleep over Donald Trump, don't. Uh, it won't make, he will not, I don't think he'll be elected, but then I didn't think he'd get this far, and who knows, uh, it's absolutely hilarious that he got as far as he did. Okay, that's mistake number one. Now we're gonna do Schrenger philosophy, uh, now we're gonna do more technical philosophy. Uh, by the way, when I first taught in Germany, I thought they had this wonderful, idea of the academic affair or stunde, where everybody could kind of goof off for 15 minutes. Nothing of the sort. Uh, I was teaching a seminar with Jürgen Habermas and Karl Otto Appel, and we would go in Habermas's office and sit and look at our watches, and then in 15 minutes, we got up like the changing of the Prussian guard. It was absolutely precise. There was nothing relaxed, or there was no uh, sort of uh, sleeping us about it. We marched in and did our seminar. Anyway, uh, uh, I've had wonderful times teaching in Germany, and one of the amazing things is to figure out how the Germans succeed in crushing the young. I'll get to, to that uh, later. Uh, every nation has to have its techniques, and the Germans have the most effective technique. Uh, the Americans have a pretty good technique for crushing the young. Anyway, we'll get to that. That's one of the mistakes. Okay, mistake number two. Um, this is an assumption about reduction. And the idea is, if consciousness is not reducible to some material processes, such as brain states, behavior, computational processes, notice the variety of things people have tried to make a reduction. If you can't make the reduction then dualism is true. Then we're stuck with metaphysical dualism. Maybe it's just property dualism, but it's some kind of dualism. We live in two realms and not just one realm. Uh, this mistake is so dumb uh, that you wouldn't think anybody could make it, but a lot of people do. Dave Chalmers made it in his a book about consciousness, and he said, we have to accept property dualism. Now, I want to tell you what I think is the correct way to see these issues. Uh, consciousness is a, a biological process caused by neuronal uh, firings in the brain. We don't know the details, but there isn't any question that consciousness goes on in the brain and it's caused by brain processes. Uh, there is no consciousness caused by the processes in my thumbnail or my big toe. Uh, it's all done in the brain. And consciousness is a biological process which is caused by and realized in the neurobiology. Roughly speaking, consciousness is to the brain as digestion is to the stomach. Uh, there's no real mystery 
about digestion in the stomach. I'm going to want to say there's no deep metaphysical mystery about consciousness in the brain. Why do we think it's such a big deal? Why isn't what I said just obvious? The answer is we have these two great traditions. One is the tradition of, tradition of God, the soul, and immortality. Uh, consciousness is not a part of the physical world. It's laid on us by God when he attaches the soul to the body. I mean, you all know that it's from Descartes, but really it goes back uh, to the ancients in different versions. Now they're opposed, these dualists, these Cartesians, by materialists, scientific materialists. The Cartesians said consciousness is not an ordinary part of the physical world. The materialists disagree. They say consciousness is not an ordinary part of the physical world, and they think they're announcing something spectacular, but they're making the same dumb mistake. They think if they grant that consciousness is an irreducible part of the physical world, you're in bed with Descartes. What's the correct thing to say? Roughly speaking, the confusion isn't about consciousness, except for the history of this. The confusion is about reduction. Consciousness is entirely explained by the behavior of the neurons. I mean, maybe neurons the wrong level. Maybe we should talk about neuronal maps or neuronal structures, or some people think subneuronal processes. But something going on in the brain is responsible for our consciousness, and the mechanism of the responsibility is causation. Okay, so you've got a set of causal relations going on in the brain that account for consciousness. So you can do a causal reduction, but you can't do an ontological reduction. I, I, have hard to, I hate using these big words like ontological, but don't worry, it just means ontologisch. Uh, <laughs> not that that's much help. Um, but in, in any case, the consciousness in the brain is still left once you do the causal account. But that's true of everything. You see, the solidity of this table uh, is such that it will support objects and it keeps its shape. You can explain the solidity in terms of the behavior of the molecules. When I was a kid, they said it's the vibratory movement of the molecules in lattice structures. I'm sure that's out of date right now, but in any case, something like that. Something like that story has to be true. So what we did with uh, solidity was say, that's all that solidity is. You can do a reduction. It's just the vibratory movement of the molecules. Well, we could do that with consciousness, but then you lose the point of having the concept in the first place. The point of having the concept is you want a name for all this sort of touchy-feely, qualitative character to our life. It's real. You can't get rid of it. But the fact that it's causally explained, though not ontologically reducible, doesn't force you to get into bed with Descartes. It's just a fact about our biological nature that you have these irreducible subjective states going on in your brain. Not something to lament. Life would be no fun without it. I mean, imagine life as a zombie. Well, if you're not, that's not the life we lead. So this is a, a mistake, is to suppose that irreducibility implies dualism. It doesn't. Roughly speaking, you can't reduce anything to something else. You can only reduce it to what it is. So the table is a pile of molecules. But the surface features of solidity, the fact that it supports other objects and maintains its shape, that's caused by the behavior of the molecules. It's not identical with the behavior of the molecules. We now got two horrendous mistakes out there. Should we keep going? I mean, I could spend a whole hour on these two mistakes, but let's go to a third one. The, the second mistake about consciousness being irreducible and that forcing you out of the world of, roughly speaking, physics and chemistry, that's a horrendous mistake, but a mistake that's almost as bad. It was the foundation of Western epistemology for 300 years is a mistake about perception. And that's the mistake that says you never really see objects and states of affairs in the world. All you can ever see is something going on in your mind well, you can see uh, 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 Descartes and Locke call them ideas. Hume called them impressions. Uh, Kant called them representations. All you can ever perceive, all you ever have access to of a perceptual kind 
are your own experiences, your own sense data. That was the word in the 20th century. Now this is a horrendous mistake because if you say you can never perceive things in themselves, beware of anybody who talks about the ding on sich, because you know you're about to get in deep trouble. Uh, if somebody says you can never perceive the ding on sich, but only your representations, well, then you've got a hell of a problem. How do you know anything? How do you know any objective facts about the world if you can never perceive things in themselves? And the history of Western philosophy, uh, it's not much of an exaggeration, I'd say, is uh, a ser uh, for 300 years, was a series of feeble attempts to answer that question. How can you overcome skepticism and account for objective knowledge if you can never have direct perceptual access to things in themselves. And a whole lot of heroic efforts were made uh, to show how you could still get knowledge, but they're all desperate and mistaken. In some ways, the most interesting is Kant, because he said, well, you can have objective knowledge, even though all you perceive are your representations, because there's a grunt, watch out when anybody speaks German, uh, because the grunt is that ding on sich and that provides the possibility of objectivity. Anyway, what's the way out of this horrendous mistake? I wish I had a blackboard. Okay, the mistake was to suppose that because when I see my hand, there is a visual experience going on in my head, that somehow or other, all I can see is the visual experience. And there was an argument for that. I call it, it's so bad, I call it the bad argument. But here's how it goes. Suppose you didn't see your hand. Suppose it was a hallucination. Well, you did see something. But now, in the hallucination case, the experience was just like the real case. Uh, the uh, hallucinatory case, the bad case, which is like the veridical or good case. So whatever you saw in the hallucinatory case, that's what you saw in the good case. Since you didn't see your hand in the hallucination, but only saw, what should we call it, call it a sense data. Then in the good case, all you see are sense data, then all you can ever see are sense data, and you're out of the world we live in and into the world of sense data. Now, I don't have to tell you where that path goes. At its absolute worst, it leads to idealism. Idealismos, as somebody once called it in some language or other, and that's very bad news. If you're forced to say you don't have access to the real world, but all there is to the real world is a sequence of ideas. Okay, that is such a horrendous mistake, I don't even know how to uh, describe it. But the, there's a short answer to the argument that I presented. And you'll have time to attack me in the discussion. We're going to have time for a discussion. Right? Okay. Here is the f flaw in the argument. The question was, what did you see in the hallucinatory case? And the answer was, well, you did see something. Even if not your hand, you saw something, an idea, an impression, a, a sense datum of a hand. The correct answer is, in the hallucinatory case, you didn't see anything. That's what it made it a hallucination, is in the case of hallucinations, and in Descartes' evil demon, and all the, the brain and the vat, all the other stock and trade of traditional epistemology, in the hallucination case, you don't see anything. Well, how about in the good case, in the validity, in the veridical case? There is a visual experience in your head. Don't you see that? No. Now, this is the most important thing I'm going to tell you. Well, maybe the third most important thing I want to tell you. Okay, and it's this. You do have a visual experience whenever you see anything, but you don't see it. Not because it's invisible, but because it is the seeing. You see, you can't see the seeing any more than when you hit something, you can hit the hitting. There is a visual experience, but you can't see it. It's not invisible, but it is the seeing. It, the seeing cannot itself be the object of the seeing. So when I see my hand, the hand causes a visual experience, but the visual experience is the seeing of the hand, and the visual experience is not itself seen, nor can it be seen because it is the seeing of the hand. Now, I honestly think if that point had been appreciated, 
uh, we would have avoided 300 years of bad epistemology. It's hard to believe, but I think something like that is right. I mean, if you just say, look, we see all this damn stuff, it's rather boring, but I have a whole pockets full of boring objects. I'm always <laughs> amazed at how many I have. I haul out an apple I didn't even know I owned, but in any case, I have all this crap. Uh, and at the point is, uh, you can see it, and when you see it, you have a visual experience, but you don't see the visual experience. Not because the visual experience is hard to see, you ought to get out your, your philosophical microscope to see it. No, the visual experience is the seeing of anything, hence you can't see it. And in, when you have a hallucination, you have a visual experience, but what do you see in the, in the hallucination? You don't see anything, okay? So what up to? We're about three horrendous mistakes, should we keep going? All right. All right, number four, causation. Now, I don't know how bad this is in Germany. I know the idealism of stuff, that's really bad in Germany. It was kind of a German disease for a long time. Um, I mean, I can't even tell you the names of all the guys. For reasons that are deeply mysterious to me, they all start with H. Uh, but uh, I'll let you make the list yourself. I thought for a long time that Husserl and Heidegger must have avoided it. Nope, I had a look. Uh, they're idealists too, though they're more disguised. Uh, but in any case, if, if, if you go back, you know, we're up to another mistake now. We're up to causation. Okay. Uh, what have we got? Three so far? Four. Or right, here's number four. The fourth mistake is to say causation is not a real relation in the real world. Causation is a kind of systematic illusion that we get because all that there is in the real world is regularity. As Hume said, there's the constant conjunction, conjunction of resembling instances. But that's all there is to causation. There's no actual causal relation in the world, and there's no experience of causation. Again, Hume, you can't experience causation. All you can experience is the regularity. You get a, a regular sequence of events, and this gives the illusion of causation because when you see the thing we call the cause, you have a, a, an idea, you have an expectation of the thing we call the effect. But causation is not a real relation in the real world. What makes causal statements true is not that there is a relation in the real world. What makes causal statements true is there are always instances of a universal generalization, a causal law. For every singular causal statement, there must be a corresponding causal law. Otherwise, there'd be no fact that corresponded to the singular statement. That's the, that's the Humean uh, doctrine, and it's a widely accepted right through the 20th century and even to the, the 21st century. You find it stated uh, by Davidson, by von Frick, to all kinds of other people uh, state this. Uh, what's wrong with it? Well, every thesis is false. You think I never experienced causation? Watch. I just experienced an amazing causal event. I caused this damn glass to go up in the air, right? By I experienced myself lifting it. Furthermore, I don't have to have uh, perceptions. I don't have to have actions, but in any perception, I experience objects in the world causing me to have visual experience. I look at this damn apple and it causes in me a visual experience. The visual experience is quite independent of my will. It's caused by outside effects and I experience the causal effect of the real world whenever I perceive anything, whenever I consciously perceive anything. So not only is it not the case that I never perceive causation, I perceive it most of my waking life whenever I perform an intentional action or perceive anything. Well, how about the claim that there has to be a causal law for any causal statement to be true? I don't see how anybody can believe that. I mean, there will be a causal explanation of how Trump got this far. Believe me, there will. I mean, there'll be causal explanations that are coming out of your ears. There'll even be PhD theses, what a thought, um, on, on, on how Trump was so successful, and those will all be causal, but there's no law. No law is going to say, well, anybody who satisfies this description uh, is going to have this kind of effect in the political arena. The size of the laws, force equals mass times acceleration, S equals, I don't have a blackboard, but anyway, these are sort of elementary laws of physics. 
They're the wrong size of event to pick out things like Trump's success in the electoral process. So there aren't enough laws to go around. Okay, what then is causation? Causation is a direct phenomenon in the world by which something makes something else happen. It's not an isolated phenomenon just between events. Most of the important causes go on all the time. Your body is held together by weak and strong nuclear forces. Electromagnetism and gravity operate all day long. It's not that my gravitational attraction to the center of the Earth is a momentary event that causally explains some other momentary phenomenon. No, these are absolute pervasive features. So contrary to the official view, one, we do experience causation all the time. Two, there aren't enough causal laws to go around. And three, it's not the case that causation is just a relation but, but among events. Causation, the basic forms of causation, the weak and strong nuclear force, and gravity and electromagnetism, they go on all the time, constantly. Okay, how are we doing? We're good. good. The question is maybe we, we take some questions now and then you, you'll, you'll... I'm just getting warmed up. How oh, much yeah. time have I got? Well, we, <laughs> we still have about 15 minutes, uh, 20 minutes for your talk and then the discussion. Oh, well, that's all right. I mean, uh, I, I can get it all done. Okay, good. 15. Good. Okay. Well, maybe we should get to the horrendous features about um, education. Uh, okay, let me start on those. Here's a mistake about philosophy that's widely believed in the United States. The PhD degree is really intellectually as well as bureaucratically a necessary condition for an academic career uh, because uh, you, you really become really smart when you get a PhD. Now, I tell you, my problem with this is I was educated by very brilliant people. None of them had PhDs. J.L. Austin, Peter Strawson, Elizabeth Anscombe, Peter Geach, Philip of Foot, Iris Murdoch, uh, Jeffrey Warnock, uh, uh, Mary <laughs> Warnock, Bernard Williams, David Pears, uh, Michael Dummett, all of the brilliant philosophers who educated me in Oxford, they all had a BA degree, nothing more. <laughs> now when they publish books, it always says M.A. Oxon. I'll tell you secretly, M.A., you buy it. It costs seven pounds, or at least mine costs seven pounds. Inflation probably forced it out. Now, what's the point of buying it? Well, you can say you're M.A. Oxon, uh, but you get to wear an M.A. gown. In many colleges can't dine without an M.A. gown on. Uh, and furthermore, it just sounds better, I guess, than B.A. Oxon. Uh, but in any case, nobody had a PhD. Now, what's going on here? Why do we think the PhD is such a big deal? You have to have a way of crushing the young. Every culture is threatened by the fact that there are too damn many young people and they stay young too long. I mean, in France, il y a trop de jeunes, il reste de jeunes trop longtemps. Qu'est-ce qu'on va faire? Okay. Now, in America, we have the technique, the PhD degree. It is a process of socialization, and we make them go through seven years of it. So at the end, they started out in their 23, they're worn out 30-year-olds by the time we send them up onto the market. The Germans, as you might have guessed, are even more efficient. They have an amazingly effective device. It's called a Habilitationsschrift. <laughs> a, a friend of mine sent me a message from Vienna. And it was a cry of ecstasy. She said, Ich bin habilitiert. You know, meaning now she was a human being. She was almost 40 years old at the time. I see. Okay, now all of these are uh, dreadful uh, devices for crushing the young, and they induce a kind of socialization. You may have been a threat when you were 23, but by the time you get your PhD, Nobody's going to worry about you, and I'm pretty sure that's true of the habilitation. I, I, I met a guy who was a faculty member at another university, and he wanted to write something about me, and I said, well, why don't you do it? Oh, no. And no, I said, i got to get habilitated. i got to get my habilitation. Otherwise, I won't be able to keep my job. Um, and so there are all these devices, and in, in America, it involves both uh, the crushing of the young but also the certification of mediocrity. 
Nobody's ever going to read these PhD theses. I guarantee it, because I know I had to read them. I, I, I mean, I get paid to read them, but nobody's going to read them who doesn't get paid to read them, doesn't have to read them. Uh, so there is uh, this essential character. Uh, now, how did I survive? Well, God knows. I think I survived because I did a thing called a defill in Oxford, and essentially, they uh, leave you alone and you write a book. And then they give you, you give them the book and they pass you or they fail you. This sort of business where we nurse people along, uh, we didn't have that in Oxford. You pass or fail, and a lot, a whole lot of famous people simply failed the defill. George Steiner is kind of well known. Ken Keniston, they simply failed. I like that. Go in and they pass you or they fail you, up or out, goodbye or congratulations. And the people examining never saw you before. So I much prefer that to the American system, which is, performs the dual process of socializing the young into a type of academic mediocrity and celebrating mediocrity by awarding them PhDs degrees. So now everybody's equal. We're all equally qualified. Okay. I'm going to mention just a couple more and then we'll stop. Well, here's one of my favorites. The beauty of this one as a mistake in philosophy is it's self-refuting. I mean, the very formulation of it is a refutation. Here's how it goes. You cannot derive an ought from an is. You have to hear the quotation marks. You cannot derive an ought from an is. You cannot derive any statement about how things ought to be from statements about how they are. I don't know if this is a big deal in Germany, but it's a big deal in, in English language philosophy. And again, it comes from Hume. It's one of Hume's most famous discoveries. Now, the marvelous thing about that is the very formulation of it is a refutation. Because let's suppose it's true. It is the case that you cannot derive an ought from an is. Well, I take it from that is statement. It follows you ought not to claim that you derived an ought from an is. You ought not to derive an ought from an is because it can't be done. That is, the very statement looks like it, in, it, it implies its own falsehood because from the fact that it's logically impossible to do something, it follows immediately that you ought not to claim that it, you've done it or that you ought not to claim that it's logically possible. What underlies this mistake is a perception that values are observed or relative. And I think that's right. Take away all humans and all conscious animals, and you've taken away all values. But from the fact that values are observer relative and thus contain an element of ontological subjectivity, it does not follow that you cannot make any epistemically objective evaluative claims. You can say this derivation is valid. That's evaluative. That's an odd statement. And this derivation is not valid. So from the fact that values are observer relative, which is a deep point, it doesn't follow that there's no epistemic objectivity about values. Okay, I'll, I'll mention just one or two more, and then we'll stop for questions, all right? One of my favorites is this. If you look at any logic textbook, usually on the very first pages, there's a crucial distinction between use and mention. I remember it, and I really, I wish we had a blackboard, I've met, but imagine a blackboard, and this example's from Quine. Quine says, if you consider the two sentence, sentences, Boston is in Massachusetts, and quote, Boston, unquote, has six letters. Well, what would we say in ordinary common sense? We'd say, well, the same word started both, but in the first case, the word is used to talk about a town, and in the second case, the word is presented, and it's talked about. And this is what by saying it's the distinction between use and mention. So far, that doesn't sound too bad, but then comes a horrendous claim. When you put quotes around the word, you form a completely new word, the proper name of the original word. So in the second statement, you couldn't see the word Boston on the blackboard because it wasn't there. What was there was the proper name of the word Boston, which is formed by form putting quotes around it. And if I asked, well, which word did you see? You'd have to say, quote, quote, Boston, quote, quote, because that would then be the name of the name of the word and so on up infinitely. Now that view is so ridiculous that only extremely sophisticated professionals uh, could ever advance it. It seems to me quite obvious 
uh, that the word is presented in, in one case and used in another, and it's the same word. You can see on the page that it's exactly the same word. If it were okay, uh, if the doctrine were okay, then you could get away with using any obscenity you like just by putting quotes around it. And you could say, well, I didn't say the, the, the forbidden, obscene, disgusting word. I only mentioned its proper name. <laughs> Uh, and that's, I think, uh, an obviously false view. Uh, this view is so mistaken that for a long time it scared me off of ever trying to learn from logic textbooks. I never read a logic book until I finally wrote one. And friend, I wrote it with a Belgian mathematician. It, it is boring. I don't recommend it, but we had to do it. <laughs> it's called The Foundations of Elocutionary Logic. Kind of what a boring title. But anyway, uh, friends of mine tell me it's a terrible book, and I'm prepared to agree, but it's the, at least the idiotic mistake of, of use and mention is not repeated in this. Let me mention one more mistake, and then I'll stop. Uh, all of our uh, judgments and all our analyses and politics and other such matters are always made from a point of view uh, within a certain set of assumptions. And there is a bad argument that goes, the fact that all judgments are made from a perspective shows that relativism is true. Because your perspective is no better and no worse than my perspective. My favorite example is this. Um, uh, I, we believe that the American Indians arrived in North America by going across the Bering Strait. A hell of a long time ago, like 20,000 years ago, they crossed the Bering Strait into North America. Now, some of the American Plains Indians believe that they are descended from the buffalo people who came out of the center of the earth, okay? So you got these two theories. One theory says they came across the Bering Strait. Another said, no, they came out of the center of the earth. <laughs> now, some anthropologists have said, one theory is as good as another. <laughs> Who's to say that their theory is wrong? After all, our theory is only made from our point of view, and they make their theory from their point of view, so relativism is true. And why is relativism so appealing? Why do intelligent, otherwise intelligent students find it appealing? I think the answer is it seems liberating to be told. We don't have to accept something as true. We invent truth. We invent our own truth because all truth is from a point of view. And that goes, this libertarianism goes with a kind of egalitarianism. I invent my truth. What's true for me is true for me. But you invent your truth. What's true for you is true for you. Okay, that is such a dumb view. I don't. I'm embarrassed to say it. But here's what's wrong with it. I, I, by the way, I'm part Cherokee, so I don't give a damn about the, uh, about these anthropologists. I'm not scared by anthropologists. Um, the uh, claim that it's equally valid to claim. That the, that the Native Americans came across the Bering Strait and the claim they came out of the center of the earth, uh, you can't have both of those because uh, they're mutually exclusive. If one's uh, true, the other's false. And the idea that, well, you can, all you've got to say is, our theory is that the Native Americans came across the Bering Strait and their theory is they came out of the center of the earth. That gets rid of the inconsistency. Yeah, but it does it by changing the subject, right? We were talking about these damn Indians and where they came from. Now, uh, what we're talking about is uh, what is my theory and what's your theory? So you can't, you avoid the inconsistency by changing the subject. Uh, relativism does not give you a just, uh, uh, the perspectival character of all knowledge claims does not give you relativism, and relativism does not give you a way of reconciling inconsistent claims. The claims remain inconsistent. You just change the subject and you, when you say it's consistent to maintain both. They have a theory that P and they have a theory that not P. Uh, that's perfectly consistent. But the problem is it can't both be the case that P and that not P. Uh, okay, so relativism, I think, is one of these dumb views uh, that is constant. I mean, I've been a professor of philosophy for 60 years, for God's sake. And, and I, it keeps coming up. Otherwise, intelligent undergraduates are tempted by relativism. And I think its appeal is, it's kind of village or mocked. It is, you have the power to create your own truth, but it's also democratic. 
uh, because everybody can create their own truth. And what I'm saying is the, the theory that underlies it is incoherent. You cannot get a coherent statement of relativism. It results in self-contradiction. Okay, why don't I throw it open? I mean, I could go on all night, but I want to save time for uh, questions. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Okay, thanks. thanks sir. Batteries, so uh, oh, okay. So We're changing batteries, high tech, <laughs> and we wait for the batteries before we have the questions. No, no, uh, right now, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, okay. Do you want to call? Uh, I, I, I would like to have one, one question because I'm, I, I, yeah, I, I okay. would like to profit uh, on your uh, that you're here and criticizing idealism and I'm quite fond of idealism. Oh, yeah. And uh, so my question is, well, the qu yeah, why would you imagine that Kant invented this concept of the Ding an sich? Well, yeah. what was his problem? Okay. And I, then I would like to know uh, if, 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 if you have the concept of dialectics, because if, yeah. you, for example, you have Hegelian dialectics, Hegelian dialectic wouldn't say that, uh, that it's all rel relative what we are perceiving, but it's just in the framing of our justifications. And these justifications uh, are always... Uh, or have to remodel them in, a, in contact with an outside world, and so we structure them anew, and then retrospectively we, we perceive that there's some kind of progress. So the first idea is, what do you think about the dialectics, and why do you think uh, Kant uh, okay. got up with the problem? All right, here is uh, Kant's problem. Um, he wants to establish the um, possibility of synthetic a priori propositions, and he gives an inventory of synthetic a priori propositions. But in order that he can establish them, given that all that we ever perceive are our own representations, what he has to say, he has to do what he calls the Copernican revolution in philosophy, where he shifts uh, the center of our uh, knowledge from the world of things in themselves uh, to our own representations. This is the Copernican shift, and then out of it comes a set of synthetic a priori propositions which derive from the fact that we have, that the mind imposes conditions on the possibility of knowledge. How then can you have objective knowledge for Kant? And the answer is that you have objective knowledge because there is a world of things in themselves, and that provides the ground, that provides the grund of our representations, you can't, he shouldn't even have said that, but, but he did say it. Uh, because you can't say the world of things in themselves causes our representations, because cause is a term of the phenomenal world anyway. So Kant had a tension, he wanted objective knowledge, indeed synthetic a priori knowledge, but he wanted to deny that you can perceive things in themselves, and he, rec he got a reconciliation of those two. But you're not convinced. Oh, I think it's ridiculous, frankly. I mean, Kant, was, Kant is worth struggling with because he was so intelligent. Uh, I became totally obsessed with the critique of pure reason, and I thought somebody ought to rewrite the whole damn book. So I did first a complete summary of the book. If anybody wants a summary, I'll put it on my website. Okay. Yeah, if you want to know what Kant said, I've got it down on paper. I've got the whole goddamn book figured out. Now, rewriting it, that turned out to be much harder, and I gave up on the project. Um, but anyway, I was laziness and stupidity on my part. But I do, if you want to know what Kant said, uh, send an email uh, to me, uh, to, uh, I'm reluctant to tell you, but Searle at Berkeley.com, and address it to Sia, uh, XIA, my wonderful uh, helper, and she'll send you the critique. She'll, uh, the, the, uh, she'll tell you what Kant really meant. But in any case, I think Kant is worth struggling with because he had, uh, he, he had a superior philosophical intellect. The problem is the whole project is roughly of the form, suppose 2 plus 2 equals 5. Wow, um, look at the amazing things you could deduce. That's what he does. Suppose you could never see the world of things in themselves. Wow, then you get this. But you still had synthetic API proofs. Then you get the Copernican revolution where instead of us being, have, uh, us being responsible to the world 
the world has to be responsible to us. And you could just feel the free song of excitement. That you, know, you could feel them all over Koenigsberg when Kant was shaking with the excitement of discovering that he made the world responsible uh, to us. Only it's the world of, of uh, representation. Anyway, I love Kant, but I, he's a pain in the neck, I can tell you. <laughs> now, I mean, about these other guys like Hegel, I couldn't understand it. I mean, I, and granted, I didn't make much of an effort. Uh, I quit early on, but I just couldn't figure it out. Kant, you can figure it out. If you really work at it, you can figure out what he's saying. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have, a, I have one question, um, and it is, what makes a simulation a simulation? And yeah. would you say that there are phenomena that cannot be, in principle, be simulated? Yeah, uh, there are two questions. One is, what makes a simulation a simulation? And are there phenomena that can't be simulated? The answer to the second question is, I don't say that, that there are phenomena that can't be simulated. Roughly speaking, anything you can des describe precisely, uh, you can do a computer simulation of. You just identify the elements in the description and put it on your computer. So anything can be simulated if you can describe it precisely enough. Uh, but what's the difference in a simulation and a duplication? Well, a simulation is just that. It's an imitation or it's a formal model. And the, the interest of the question derives from the fact that we now have computer simulations of uh, stunning cognitive capacities. You know, you can have computer simulations of uh, chess and computer simulations of flying airplanes. Now, some of these you can actually work. You can use them. You use the computer simulation to fly the airplane, and now they've got one that'll drive a car. I think that's terrific. Don't think it's of any psychological relevance, because remember, the computer program is defined purely formally or syntactically as a series of symbols. And actual human cognition has conscious mental contents. Now, it doesn't matter for most purposes. If somebody's got, got a, they've got a computer program that'll drive your car better than you do, who cares if it's thinking? It doesn't need to think, it, let, it, let it do its thing. And when I do uh, my uh, arithmetic uh, with a machine like this, I mean, these, are, these can do all kinds of crap. You wouldn't, you'd be amazed at what you can do. I don't even know how it works. Uh, but uh, you can do, uh, use it for all sorts of practical purposes. The only mistake comes if you think it's psychologically relevant. You think the computer uh, chess playing program actually played chess. It didn't. See, in order to play chess, you got to be conscious that you're playing chess. You got to know you open with pawn to king four. You got to know your rook is threatened on the right. Uh, and a computer program knows none of that because it doesn't know anything. It's not designed to know anything. It's designed to do a simulation of chess playing. So, for all these essential notions like playing chess or rem remembering or having intelligence, the computer has a zero. It isn't that it's got a little bit and we need to give it more, it's got zero. However, we have this metaphorical observer relative uh, sense of these words, and it's perfectly all right to say this computer plays best, better, chess better than that computer, or this computer is more intelligent than that computer, recognizing that all of that is in the eye of the beholder. Computers have, they intrinsically have zero intelligence because they have no consciousness. Yeah. yeah. I have a question about perception. I have animals the same perception to the same world as we do. For example, the famous bats. Uh, as they have a different device to perceive the world. Yeah. Do we know what is it, it is to uh, like to be a bat? Or, yeah. Uh, is we have no idea of. Right. Well, this, can you repeat the question? Because I'll repeat the question. Uh, <laughs> I have used notions like perception. But there are beings that have perceptions that enable them to cope that's completely different from ours. An example, by the way, is from Thomas Nagel. Tom Nagel said, consider bats. Uh, bats uh, sleep all day long, hanging upside down, and then they fly around in the dark and navigate by, by bouncing sound waves off the wall. So the bat flying around in here wouldn't hit anything because it bounces sound waves off the wall and it detects uh, the presence of physical objects by these reflected sound waves. What's it like? Nobody knows. Well, we don't know what it feels like to be a bat, and that was Nagel's uh, point, is that you could know all there was to know about the physiology of the bat, 
and you could know, all of us to know about the functional relations between the input stimuli and the output behavior. But what's it feel like? What's it feel like to fly around the dark and navigate by bouncing sounds off walls? What's it feel like to sleep all day long hanging upside down from a rafter? Uh, and the truth is, nobody knows. We may never know what it but, feels but, like. But isn't this the, the argument for Kant in a way to say, well, if you have a different kind of apparatus of perception, yeah. then you're a different kind of world. Yeah. So, so the world well, you're perceiving is dependent on your, on your capacity. And if you, if you divide the different capacities, the, the reality dissolves in, in something that is always objective to one apparatus of perception. Yeah. And so uh, I think that's the idea why Kant says, well, there's something out there, that's for sure. But it depends on the objectivity we perceive it and yeah. such. It depends on the on our apparatus of perception. Yeah, I agreed with you up to the point where I said it's a different world. We all live in the same world, but we get at it with a different apparatus. When I first got interested in the brain, I went and bought all the freshman textbooks. If you want to learn a subject, by the way, go buy the freshman textbooks. Don't you don't have to read uh, uh, pop literature. Just if the, if, you, if the freshman can understand it, you can understand it. And I bought all the freshman textbooks on the brain. And one of these books, they made an amazing claim. They said, cats see color differently from the way we see color. And I thought, my God, have they ever been a cat? These authors <laughs> even know what it's like to be a cat. And the answer is, of course, that's a perfectly reasonable claim. They know that the cat has different color vision uh, because uh, they look at the color receptors. I forget the differences, but the cat has different color receptors from ours, and consequently, the cat has different vision from ours. But the cat doesn't live in a different world, lives in the same world. I have had wonderful dogs. But it doesn't live, for example, in the social world. Has, well, uh, there's data we science, know. but it doesn't. Seem like I don't know what kind of uh, social life cats have, but I can tell you about my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I've had wonderful dogs: Frega, Russell, Ludwig, and now Tarski. All your enemies? No, no. I mean, I, I, mean I, I wouldn't name a dog after somebody I didn't admire enormously. I and Tarski was a. Problem for me because at that time you couldn't get a good Ben. I like Ben Zenon on the, you probably never heard of them, but they're great dogs. Bernie's Mountain Dogs. And I couldn't get a decent one in the United States, so I had Tarski flown in when he was a three month old puppy. Uh, pretty big, even for that. And he, like the rest of us, he had to change train, uh, planes in Frankfurt, but he made it. He got all the way to Berkeley. Um, and uh, I don't know how we got off onto this, but in any case... Well, the, the difference between the world... Oh, yeah. Are uh, the actions living okay. in the same world as we are? Tarski lives in the same world that I live in. It's just that he doesn't worry about his income tax, and he doesn't worry about the forthcoming elections, because he doesn't have those... doesn't have a language. Uh, but he does worry about when he's getting fed on time, and he's got plenty of beliefs and desires. You want to see desire in action come around the house when Tarski's, when it's dinner time for Tarski. You know, right, well, right now you know a lot about your dog, but you didn't know very much about the, the, the bat. Yeah, well, I don't. And the answer is because I don't know enough about the bat physiology and the kind of effects that it has. And we may never know. It's quite possible uh, that we may never have any idea what it feels like. Uh, to fly around uh, and avoid banging into things by doing a sonar echolocation. But we do know the bat's conscious, and we do know that the bat is able to cope with the world by having these input-output relations. What we don't want to say is, well, bats don't live in the same world. Of course they do. We couldn't buy them and sell them and have a, treat them medically and make sure that their uh, their flying apparatus is okay. Uh, so we all live in the same world, bats and ants and us and dogs. I, I, it's just that we have different apparatus for coping with the world, and bats have a radically different apparatus, which is why Tom used that as an example. He was showing that materialist accounts are unable to capture all the facts, because there are facts about the bat that we cannot describe in a functionalist vocabulary. Remember the functionalist theory of the mind says, all the rest of the mental state is input, stimuli, mechanisms for processing and output behavior. We might know all that, but we still not know what it was like, what it's like to be a bat, and that was his point. Mm -hmm. Other okay. questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah like a question about emotional reduction. Yeah. Uh, you gave the example of solidity, yeah. which is 
which seems to logically supervene on the properties of molecules. Meaning yeah. If you add up force fields, they have to uh, aggregate into solidity, uh, whereas uh, there is no logical relation between your synapses and consciousness. You can, yeah. uh, you, you mentioned the possibility of zombies, so yeah. I think um, and on that sense, the two reductions are not apart. Well, can you repeat the question, yeah, or is it too complicated? Okay. Well, the, the question is this: I, I'd rather repeat it without using supervenience, because that's a pretty suspicious notion, as you know. But in any case, um, we can see how that once you have the molecules moving in this way, the object has to be solid, right? But you couldn't, in that way, see how once the neurons were firing in this way the uh, entity has to be conscious. That the way that, that consciousness supervenes on brain processes is different from the way that solidity supervenes on molecular behavior. Is that a fair sum summary of the question? Yeah. Okay, I think that's right. I mean, uh, and all these analogies are only good up to a point. What I wanted to get across is the fact that you don't get an ontological reduction that gets rid of the reduced phenomenon uh, doesn't show uh, that you're forced to dualism. You're not forced to dualism. Uh, biology is a part of the real world, and the biology both causes and realizes consciousness. Now it's tempting to think, well, there's two different, completely different things going on. Uh, there's the consciousness, and then there's the biology. That's wrong. When I raise my arm, my conscious effort causes the arm to go up. But the only way it can work is if there's a whole lot of processes going on in the plumbing. And we actually know about them. We know the specific neurotransmitter. Uh, neuron firings in the motor cortex set up the secretion of acetylcholine at the synaptic junctions until it, you reach the final synaptic junctions where the axon end plates hook right up to the motor neurons. And at that point, the, the acetylcholine has to attack uh, the uh, motor neurons, and then a whole lot of wonderful things happen, and the actin filaments and the myosin filaments. So the physiology of this is pretty well understood. The mistake is to think, you got two different things going on. There's my conscious Geisliga uh, effort here, and then there's all this sort of stuff going on in the plumbing. I want to say that's one event. There's one event which is me consciously raising my arm, and that event has a lower level of description, or lots of lower levels, what it involves a whole lot of neuron firings. Just like a car. When you drive your car, there are a whole lot of oxidization of individual hydrocarbon molecules. No oxidization, no car movement. But now they add up to an explosion. They add up to an explosion in the cylinder. And similarly, I want to say, this adds up to a conscious effort to move my arm. You can't separate the consciousness from the neuron firings, and you can't separate the neuron firings from the consciousness. Now, as he was pointing out, though, the analogy breaks down, all analogies do at some point, because in the case of consciousness, you have this qualitative subjectivity. You have a feeling of what it's like to raise your arm, and you don't have that with solidity. You have more questions? Here's the guy. Uh, but then, uh, you said that uh, Chalmers makes a mistake about uh, claiming that there is a big need to accept um, property dualism and to say this is wrong. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand what is your uh, opinion on the logical status of the consciousness. Okay, let me describe it. There are a whole lot of biological phenomena that are essential to life. Now, photosynthesis is just as amazing as consciousness because it converts the sun's energy into the chemical energy of, of uh, food uh, for, uh, that you know, life depends on photosynthesis. Okay, uh, among these amazing properties uh, that are uh, caused by and realized in biological structure is uh, consciousness. And you have consciousness as a biological property along with a whole lot of other important biological properties. Now the mistake is to say that because consciousness is irreducible, then it must live in a different ontological realm altogether. It, we must be forced to property dualism. Not 
substance dualism that says there are souls and bodies, but property dualism that says there's a completely different set of properties in the universe, mysterious properties that have no physical powers. Now, a guy who holds this view, and I think it's a crazy view, is Dave Chalmers, and Dave you know, consistently uh, then says, but of course, consciousness can't make any difference to the world. So I thought my arm went up because I decided to raise it, but no, he says, epiphenomenalism. Consciousness can't reach inside the physical world because the physical world is causally closed. So here's the physical world, all causally closed, and then outside, my pathetic consciousness would like to move my arm, but it can't, it can't do it. My arm is moved entirely by this plumbing process that I described. I think this is a horrendous mistake. It's one of the, was the first mistake that I, or my second mistake on my list of mistakes. Uh, say some more. No, he doesn't. He, he's an epiphenomenalist. Could you repeat the yeah, question, repeat please? Um, I, I had to review Dave's book, and so I read it pretty carefully. I wrote a whole summary. Of, I mean, when I review these guys, it's not worth it because I do a huge amount of work. I wrote a summary of the whole damn book, and um, I maybe changed his mind since, but he then, at that point, defended epiphenomenalism. Now, what is epiphenomenalism? <laughs> epiphenomenalism is the view that though consciousness exists, it can't make any difference to the physical world. So I decided to raise my arm, my arm went up, but my decision had nothing to do with the movement of my arm, because my decision was part of the mental world, and the arm movement was part of the physical world, and here comes a magic slogan. The physical world is causally closed. Now because it's causally closed, nothing can come outside and move any, from outside and move anything in the physical world. So Dave is forced to say, uh, that consciousness, though it's real, has no effect on the universe, has no effect on the world. And I know he believes this crap because he had a, I had a big conference down in Santa Cruz and I was asked to lecture down there and I went and said all this stuff down there. Now, this was years ago, maybe he's changed his mind, but this he believed at one point, yeah.